so welcome um, to today's uh, Walk Listen Cafe. Um, today we have with us um, uh, two guests, uh, one of which is Henna Such. And Henna is um, the co-founder and CEO of Go Jointly, which is a health and wellness company uh, which created the award-winning walking wayfinding and nature connection app with the same name which is go jointly um, and the app helps to break down barriers um, to walking by helping people to discover walks to create their own walks uh, and to store outdoor adventures uh, or to, sorry to share outdoor adventures with uh, their friends and hannah is also the host of the podcast nature bands with a z uh, and is also a proponent for tech for uh, good, tech for good. And we also have with us um, Fabiola Santana, who is a dance artist exploring performance as a way to connect, exchange and transform. And she has been uh, researching grief using performance for the last six years or so. And in Lancaster, she has researched and tested her project, A Home for Grief, which is currently touring, not just in Lancaster, but also in Liverpool and Manchester. Fabiola is of Lusophone extraction with Angolan and Portuguese roots. And with that, has a, uh, as, with that as a background, has been seeking to understand the potential for community building and collective healing through performance and participation. And um, part of uh, Fabiola's work, A Home for Grief, is a walk for grief in which she has created a sensitive and reflective outdoor piece which connects with the grief that many of us experience, which is a sound walk which guides you through the streets of Lancaster and presumably also of uh, Manchester and um, um, Liverpool. Uh, as you experience uh, through this uh, sound walk, uh, a gentle conversation with from different backgrounds on loss, grief and tenderness. And uh, a walk for grief was built using or on Hannah's platform, Go Jointly. Uh, so before we uh, hear from Fabiola, I think we'll start with Hannah. So Hannah, the floor is yours. Thanks for that excellent intro. In a nutshell, uh, my background is that I worked on a digital product and service design for like around 15 years. Um, I was agency side before, so I worked with the likes of Google, Xbox, Nike, the Science Museum, creating interactive experiences um, across different platforms. So everything from things like set-top boxes, um, where you watch uh, video on demand, through to apps, through to websites, through to sort of digital installations in, in museums. And then to cut a long story short, I ended up uh, joining a, an old colleague and starting up a design consultancy called Furthermore. And a few years into that, we um, were kind of complaining about the fact that it was actually really hard to find nice places to go for a walk. Um, like every, like the information that you got was like quite disparate. Wow. You couldn't really tell whether or not it was good for your, you and your needs. So, for example, at the time, I wanted short walks that I could do with my kid. I had a buggy at the time. And when we started to look into the background behind, um, you know, like why there wasn't anything around there or out there for us that we felt met our needs, we realised that that was actually an opportunity for us to create a walking app and Go Jauntly was born. Uh, it was my second baby and uh, it's like blood, sweat and tears to be honest. Um, but we started in um, 2015 and so we're sort of predominantly self-funded. We've won some grant funding and we've had to do everything really slowly but surely. But it has meant that we've been able to be like a bit more sort of sustainable. We've had around 300,000 downloads now, and uh, we average around 25,000 monthly active users. It's, you know, taken this time to get here, but we're really proud of our achievements. Um, we're also available on the App Store and the Play Store. Uh, iOS came first because that's where our skill set was, but Android was least released like a couple of years later, and we're slowly sort of getting parity on features between the two platforms. And we're actually like a regular uh, partner with various local authorities across the UK. 
we work with consumer brands, everyone from like Liz Earl Beauty Co, which is like a, a, a British skincare brand to Palm Olive, which is like a, a Colgate, a Colgate brand, um, as well as uh, sort of some sort of smaller public health uh, clinical commissioning groups, uh, organizations like that. And Go Journey was really born to try and break down the barriers to walking. Um, as you're probably aware, there's so many barriers to walking from like not knowing where to go, not knowing whether it's um, wheelchair friendly, whether there's loos, whether there's uh, it's going to be muddy in the winter. And um, by creating Go Jauntly, I think what we've tried to do is create like a really personalized experience. So like wherever you are in the UK um, and further afield, you open up the app and it tailors to your location and it surfaces walks near you. Um, we've got most of our walks are in the UK. We do have some walks further afield. So we've got a whole bunch in Los Angeles. We've got some in Sri Lanka. We've got some in Sydney, Rotterdam, Amsterdam, you know, like uh, kind of places all over. But the highest concentration of walks is in the UK. And we have ambitions to expand. But again, slowly but surely, try not to stress myself out too much because uh, being being a quote entrepreneur is uh, quite a lonely, hard experience. But so hopefully you've been like uh, looking at the video um, that I've been sharing on screen. It's on a loop. So I'll just talk you through it quickly. And what you're seeing at the moment is the ability to add your own walks to the app. So a majority of our walks are created by us or our partners, but around 37% of our walks are user generated. So wherever you are, you can create walks. And that's why we've got walks as far as Field of Sri Lanka and um, Los Angeles and places like that, because people have been creating and sharing walks. And um, this is the home screen. And it's shows you a collection of walks near you that, that you that might satisfy you or intrigue you, pique your interest. This is the Capital Ring, which is like a greenway walk around the outskirts of London. It's super popular and um, it was made in partnership with Transport for London. And we um, basically try and break down some of those barriers by showing people step by step photos of the route so they can see what they in advance, what they might see on the route. And then also makes it easier to navigate because you don't have to constantly look at your map and your phone. You can kind of almost flip through the pictures quickly, read the information and then flip to map view if you need to, and then put the phone away in your pocket. Um, and it's just looped back to, to creating a walk. So it's as simple as taking pictures whilst you're out and about. Um, when you've got them in the order that you're happy with, it kind of shrinks down and you can move the wayfinding points if you need to. You can add information that other people might find interesting. And then you hit done, you publish, and then we review it, make sure it's good enough to feature. And then boom, it gets shared to the community. Uh, just going to move on to the next screen. So um, obviously the pandemic has affected so many people in so many ways. And it affected us in that we couldn't go out and about making walks. I mean, technically we could because it was work, but we didn't want to. We wanted to stay home and we started kind of trying to work out ideas how we can help people walk more when actually their daily exercise is maybe limited to an hour or they can only stay close to their home because they need the toilet every 45 minutes or you're not supposed to leave so you need to stay home so we created this new kind of green roots feature it was funded through like innovate uk and and it's been further further supported by sport england but it essentially creates dynamic green routes wherever you are in the uk and ireland so this is where it thinks i am at the moment it's created an automatic green route for me from my doorstep and if i don't like that one i have a choice to go and find another one so you know perhaps i have more than 15 minutes which is which does happen on occasion um like i might want to do a 5k hike or a 10k hike or I have a bit more time I can pick another one that suits me and it takes it in London it takes in this thing called the Tranquil City Index which you may or may not have heard of before it basically analyzed things like noise pollution air pollution green space street trees um, busyness of roads and it kind of gives you a, a tranquility rating 
that then can divert you on a route that is actually going to be more pleasant and least polluted and potentially even more leafy. So in London, that's how it works. And then outside of London, we take on board different parameters like proximity to green space, um, blue space, like rivers, canals and things like that. And we can send people on quieter routes. So apps like Google Maps or City Mapper, they traditionally take you on like the fastest route from A to B. What we're trying to do is we're trying to help people go the greenest route from A to B. And quite often it's only a couple of minutes longer and you might not know about it. Um, so that's just a little demo of, of that feature. It launched on um, in May on Android. So it's really new, uh, designed and built during the pandemic, also whilst homeschooling, which was a bit crazy. And um, on in November on iPhone. And since then, we've had 31,000 miles walked using our dynamic green routes as well. And it, it gives us the opportunity to like be able to create walks wherever people are. And the goal is to roll this out across Europe and North America. Um, but that's something that we have to wait until we've got the right level of time and funding um, to be able to do. But we're really keen to, to kind of work on that. And then we've got some other additional features uh, which have been co-created with different partners. One is audio guides and um, we've got a whole bunch of unique routes across the UK which are narrated by James Wong who's like a famous TV presenter and botanist and he talks about the flora and the fauna that you might see on the routes. And then we've got this like what we're calling an interpretation panel at different points of interest, you can swipe up and you can get extra cultural heritage uh, information about um, buildings, uh, uh, kind of ruins, all sorts of things. And uh, that was made in partnership with one of our local authorities. And you can also download the trails for offline mode, um, should you be in an area which has low uh, 4G, 5G connectivity. And then just going to wrap up a little bit on my presentation. I wanted to just quickly demo uh, an example of one of Fabiola's amazing uh, sound walks. Um, she, as, as we mentioned earlier, she did them across Lancaster, uh, Manchester and Liverpool, and they were tailored to the location. And it was essentially an invitation to meditate on grief while walking. Fabiola created all the walks herself. We supported her with the with the basics, like adding uh, like how to best create walks, like adding the audio and things like this. But this is essentially just a platform to host Fabiola's yeah, creativity. Um, you might be able to hear a little bit of sound or not. I'm not sure, but Fabiola is going to talk through that in a minute. But I just wanted to show you like how Fabiola's walk. Fabiola's walk looked on the Go Jauntly app and she was able to tailor it and you can listen to the audio and you can read the transcripts as well. Um, but yeah, I feel like it's a kind of a good point to, to hand over. Thank you very much. Um, it certainly is a very pretty app. <laughs> I tried to use it uh, here in Sao Paulo, but the number of routes that I had at my disposal is uh, quite limited. Um, <laughs> Sorry, uh, but I uh, no, it's okay. But I'll have a question or two maybe about that. But uh, I'll we'll switch uh, immediately to Fabiola. Thank you, Hannah. That was brilliant, and it's so I don't know. It just kind of made me feel a bit I don't know <laughs> emotional, I suppose, to see to see it like that. You know, like flickering and seeing the photos, and because it's been a few days since I've. Well, I've come to Portugal. I'm based in the UK in Liverpool, um, but it's been a few days since I've touched base with it in the same way. So that was that was nice. And I'm starting to look at it retrospectively because the project has happened. So, yeah, thank you. Thanks for that. That was brilliant. Um, yeah. So where to start, really? I mean, I think it'll be, I'll explain a little bit, but I think, and I'll show you, um, I'll, you can, you'll, um, I'm going to play you a little clip uh, from the audio, but I just want to give you a little bit of context uh, before we go on to do that. So the walk, uh, the walks are part of a bigger project, which is called A Home for Grief. And that project has three different strands one is this audio walk, another one is a performance for one person at a time with me, so it's just a one. The last one was an installation. Um, all, all three are supported by a walk, that's why there's a walk in 
Lancaster, one in Liverpool and one in Manchester. Um, and this was the first time that we've done it in this way and more specifically to today um, and the context of GoJuntly. Um, we, so I've created this with my partner and collaborator, Will Dickey. He can't, couldn't be here today, but um, he, um, we very much were looking for, we previously had done something with QR codes in the landscape. I don't know if you're familiar with QR codes, but we put them in little picture frames when we first developed the walk three years ago. And we put them in the, in the landscape. And so you'd have to like find them and, um, so, but that had many, many challenges. And so this time I'm really looking for uh, a platform um, that could support the sensitivity um, and the quite peculiar <laughs> way and things that we were trying to do. And it was very interesting because I, you know, searched many places, talked to techno spoke to technologists, eventually uh, this led me to go jointly and it was quite exciting. And it was so, 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 I mean, Hannah's here, but if Hannah wasn't here, I'd say the same thing. It was so approachable, you know? I just wrote to Hannah, you know, to go jointly team and they were so approachable and so like ready to just have a chat. And that felt so heartwarming, you know? So that's kind of how we started this little project. I mean, it wasn't little, it was quite, it was quite time, you know, it was a lot, but just, you know, it was wonderful. So before I carry on, I think I'd like to just tell you before I play the audio that like uh, Babak and Hannah um, mentioned, it is, and as the title says, it is a home for grief or a walk for grief as it is in Lancaster. Um, and so I will play you one of the audios. There are six audios, uh, seven actually, sorry, within the trail. Um, there are seven audios and we kind of kept the element of um, the element of connecting with the landscape. So using um, the platform for Go Jointly, we could put the photos for people to have direction, but also in the walk itself, it very much connects you to where you are. So you can hear me talking about a tree. Uh, you can hear me talking about the river. And, you know, I'm very much linking it to the landscape um, of where you are when you're reading. And there are also invitations to, to actions in the landscape to connect. So, for example, there's a place where I invite and I do it before you walk to tie a ribbon for remembrance uh, in the railings of the bridge in Lancaster. The one you'll hear, there's, I invite you to mark your height with chalk in this lamppost. Um, and then there's another where I invite you to um, write the initials of th those that you're grieving for on a stone. And so what you see when you're walking is even though you're walking alone, you start seeing an accumulation of people who've come before you, like the marks. So it feels like you're actually maybe not walking alone and also you're quite supported by the audio. And with that said, I also want to tell you that listen to this gently you would, this is the third audio piece that you'd listen on the journey. I wouldn't want to play you the first one because there's a lot of instructions within it. But I want you to have more of a sense of what it is. But this to say that you'd have a more gentle way into it. So you'll hear very personal stories from real women that I spoke to in the northwest of England um, about their experiences. <laughs> and so I just want you to... Be gentle with yourself as you hear it, because it might stir something. It may not, but it might do. Um, so if you need to mute <laughs> at any point, if it's too much, that's okay. But it shouldn't. It shouldn't be. It's quite calm. Uh, but just in case. Thank you. I'm standing and looking at this lamppost. I see a thin layer of moss growing over black chipped paint. I'm going to mark my height on it with white chalk. Could you join me and mark your height too? Then others will know we were here. 
I remember marking Dad's height in the kitchen on a white tile. I think Mum kept that tile somewhere as a memento. Slowly, I watched my grandmother forget every memory she had. I saw more of her mind, and I watched her forget her son. As I look at my mark now, I'm imagining his height, where the crease in his neck would be, where I would rest my head and play with his beard. Dad used to sleep in until I woke him on my lunch break. I remember the excitement of pushing open the door. I would sneak up onto the bed to wake him, gently, always gently. Our women have more to say. They hear a moment. I remember sitting um, with my grandma after she passed um, for hours and just like, you know, stroking her face and studying all the contours and like stroking her hand. And I stayed there for hours. Like I didn't want to leave her, you know. But at the same time, I thought, you know, death is beautiful. This is how it can be. I'm going to keep walking now, up this fenced path opposite our lamppost between the trees. When that path ends, I'm going to turn left and take another path that leads straight uphill. I will leave a picture for you of that turn, just in case. You could swipe ahead to check it now if you need to. Just remember to swipe back and press play again so you can keep listening as you walk up. You're ready now. It's not far and there's no rush. Walk slow. There's so much to notice. And uh, let's go. E bonito aqui, não é? Absolutely, just you know, stepping behind the veil. I, I really come to terms with that. I so don't want to die. Even though I think about it every day, you know, I think about I'm getting older and there are always reminders. Time to the top of the stairs, and you know, or you bend down. My father used to say, when you bend down to pick something up, you look around and see if there's something else you can pick up while you're down there. I so love this world. I so love my life. I so love the people around me. That it's oh, don't take me away, please. You know, I've got, I just I don't fear death. I what happened before? You know, in the here and now, it's like, oh my God, will there be a health service? Will there be social services? Will there be people to? take care of me in the way that I would like to be taken care of. But I, there's no point in dwelling on that. I just stick with my vision of how I want this world to be. A caring, loving, equitable, you know, kind world. I think there's so much we don't know. We haven't discovered. And yeah, to me, in a way, it's no different from Back, going back into the earth and creating new. Remember, keep walking uphill. You will come to an opening on the left of the path, signposted Path House. Walk into that field and we will wait on the grass for this bit to finish. It's not far. Take time. Um, I was also really fortunate that I had a very nice evening with Max the night before he died. It was just really, his whole energy had shifted, actually. She was always so, like, a, full of life and um, really fixated on things. And if you wanted to do something, you wanted to do it there and then, like, lots of energy. He had a lot of energy. He was so calm that evening, and um, he'd actually told me that he had a squirrel in front all the way up him to his chest and stare at him in the eyes the day before it happened. 
and I remember him putting out his hand because I was working late that night put out his hand and I thought he was passing me something so I looked at it and he literally just wanted to take my hand so he took my hand just squeezed it really tight and when I think about it now like he didn't know he was going to die the next day but it was like something was going on that was kind of calming him and making him feel peaceful because I felt that I've gone left off the path and I'm standing in the small field now. I'm going to sit on the fallen tree nearby where I came in. I will leave you a picture so you can see it here too. That's one of the audios that you hear in the Lancaster walk. And as you can hear, uh, uh, there's quite a lot of references to, you know, the fallen tree and the tree and this, the lamppost, and so it'd be these specific points in the landscape. And the idea as well um, for this is for the walk itself with the grief and with the stories, uh, personal stories, is that when I was growing up and I grew up as a brief child, so that's part of the story you hear about my dad, you know, um, and my grandmother, um, is that I felt like I could walk around in a, a place full of people, but you wouldn't necessarily know what was going on inside of me. It's something quite lonely. And also, because I lived by the sea, walking by the sea is something quite contemplative and meditative, you know, if I needed to go for whatever feeling. So that was one of the reasons uh, for, for doing a walk for one person where you take your headphones and you go on this walk. Um, and also because I think grief in some ways takes you out of your community if other people around you aren't experienced, if some people around you aren't experiencing the same way that you are, but then at the same time you do find a community within it of other people who are grieving. So that's also what we're trying to do here and start conversations you know maybe hopefully you'll go on the walk you listen and then you can go home and talk about it with someone or a friend or you know and so that's part of what we were trying to do here um but yeah i'm sure there's more things for me to say but i kind of just want to open up and let other people ask and you know so yeah all right thank you very much uh, i thought this was very nice um uh, one question I have, uh, Fabiola, uh, for you is uh, because you mentioned about starting a conversation. The uh, sound walk that you made uh, and or go jointly as the app, does it provide a venue for, for people to participate or to communicate through the app itself? Um, the way that we've made the walk, you don't. So there's a difference that I just want to make clear is that the way we've done the walk and the way that the 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 app works is may not always be particularly the same because we've used the app in a very particular way so for us it's not directly that you can communicate with other people but there is at the at the end then it takes you into it takes you into you know like a website or connects you to social media or connects you to a forum where you can then share, you know, virtually, or you can get in touch. So it's not at that point, the walk in, in and of itself is not at that point for an immediate exchange, but something that we hope can reverberate. When, it, when the walk comes combined with the one-to-one -one performance, or because you do the walk and then you'd come to meet me and we'd be together, or when you'd go to the installation, then it would be perhaps more immediate that exchange but that's not particularly the function of it to start the conversation right there and then but Can i you let, say a little bit oh sorry go on i was just going to say i'll let hannah explain if yeah. you know if there's other yeah yeah so at the moment like there's no sort of like group walks or kind of social media communications happening um on the go jointly app and that's kind of on purpose right now. Um, we've got enough social media platforms out there. We don't need to add to that. 
there's much better event platforms um, such as Eventbrite and Meetup and, and stuff like that. So people could separately organize their events, Facebook events, and then potentially use one of our trails to, to go on. We're really, because we're small, self-funded, and uh, we've really, and there's lots of other apps out there. What we wanted to do is we wanted to do walking and we wanted to do walking really, really well. And there's no point in our opinion, adding lots and lots of features that people don't end up using or other platforms do better than us. So we, we, we've gone strong and hard on walking. No, I understand. Uh, but my question was not actually so much about uh, that you should be as feature rich as uh, the next app, but more very simple that uh, many people who uh, experience, um, some people who experience grief, uh, or in this case are confronted with other people's grief and reflect on their own, uh, might actually have a strong desire to uh, uh, to communicate um, in, in whatever way with, uh, with others who uh, uh, might also have experienced the same, that is, have also used the app. Uh, but I want to pick up on something, Fabiola, that you said um, uh, after uh, in your first response, is that you said that people do the walk and then they meet you. Well, depends. Um, and and just to say, just to say that uh, with through the Go, which I think is important to note, was that through Go Jointly app at the end of this walk, we have uh, a page that, like I said, you can access to then connect with people. So there is that kind of care, but it is left more to the walker to do that connection rather than us, you know, starting a conversation. And actually for us, I just wanted also to point out that the lack of the social media frenzy was actually really nice because you, you, we don't want to bombard people that have been reflecting on grief to all of a sudden feel overwhelmed. So that was actually really lovely. Um, and then to go on to say on when they meet me. So like I said, there's three different versions. So there is one version where it's the walk alone. There's a walk where you go then into an indoor space where you have a performance just with me, where then you together we do different tasks to keep reflecting and where people share more of their story, the person who comes um, very sensitively. I will put a link on the ch on the chat so that people can have a little bit of a wonder and we'll have more videos after because we've just done it. So we'll have more documentation in a few months to share. But there are already a few things there that you can have a little bit of a notion. And then lastly, there's one where you do a walk and this was what happened in Manchester. You do a walk and then you go inside the theatre but into an installation like exhibition space. So it's again quite a quiet reflex, reflective space, which is safe, um, but you don't meet me. And so therefore you have more time to be on your own, just calmly inside of a space. So there's different levels of engagement that we've tried to create through this process. And through the walk is one of you as an individual going from being within your community to being within the same landscape, but in some way separate from your community as you're going to, for the walk through your experience and then coming back into your community again, if that makes sense, through the audio, right? Yep. And then, yeah. What I find interesting in how you describe this is that whereas um, the sound walk is something that can easily be repeated by anyone at any time, uh, the other um, events that you describe where they meet you or they interact with you or they have to go into uh, this performance space, um, they are very uh, discreet, as in they cannot be uh, scaled up. Um, they have to be booked in a way. So that's a very interesting uh, dynamic. Uh, one more question about, uh, or taking a bit of a step back in relation to your focus on grief. Um, <clears throat> as I read at the start, or yeah, as I mentioned at the start of our call and as you write in your bio, uh, you have been focusing on grief for six years, apparently. That's an awful long time to grieve. What's the why? To be honest, I can say that I've been grieving since I was seven years old. I'm now 32. I'm still grieving. And I say this and I use this word not with fear, but as a way to try to start for myself to just focus on the fact that it is a process, right? Um, it takes time, it takes the time it needs. So 
first when I was seven, my dad died um, quite tragically in an accident and it was very sudden. Um, so that really shaped who I am. Um, and then my grandmother, uh, she had Alzheimer's after a while, my dad's mum. And so her death was very different. It was actually, you know, quite a lot pro more prolonged in many ways. And so, but then as a child growing up, as a brief child, it's quite hard to have the tools to talk about it and the adults around you because they're also grieving and they're also concerned with you being safe. They don't always also have the tools to have you safely engage in an exchange about it. And so I think it's taken six years to get to this point because one, because of me, so I'd be ready to share and to talk in the way that I can now, but also because it's taken a while to collect these uh, conversations with these women and it's taken a while to focus and to have at the center of the work care, care for the person who comes to walk, care for the person who comes to meet me and do the performances. Um, and so there's no uh, jumps, there's nothing that will jolt you, there's, you know, it's just kind of very caring and very carefully and sensitively made. So that's part of the reason it's taken so long. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then also a, a lot of the focus of your work is on participatory um, mm -hmm. uh, performance, right? Uh, so and I suppose this is a very good example of this, particularly of the uh, event related uh, um, interventions that you facilitate through this. Uh, on uh, the history of your grief, with particularly a reference to your father, I think Bob's question is quite apt. Bob, do you want to ask oh. the question? Uh, in, it, yeah, it's my conviction that performance art is morphing into walking art. It was the same feeling I had in the 60s with performance art morphing from fine art. And why from then on I labelled myself performance artist rather than artist, which died a death. What do you think, particularly in relation to your necrogeography? Uh, uh, sorry, I don't know. I exactly understand the question. What, what do you mean by necrogeography? Just about ne relating to death. Sorry, necrogeography is the geography of death. Okay. So I, okay, so I did understand it. Um, yeah. I think one of the attempts here is to um, make place, create a place. And so with these actions in the landscape is both trying to highlight that when people, when, when people die, um, and I'm particularly talking about people because I know there's other kinds of grief, right? I know, you know, it's not just people that, die there's other there's relationships there's all sorts of things uh, there's animals <laughs> which actually we touch upon but um is we often we're not particularly some people can be attached to a cemetery in particular but other people are attached to the landscape that of their lives um you know particularly urban or countryside or and so i think that that's kind of what we're trying to do so he listen to those spaces and create places where people can be on an open everyone where everyone is because grief is quite private a lot of the time especially in the UK I've found oh no I can't say the UK but England and so I think it's an attempt to bring out some expressions into public space does that answer the question no can I ask no. it another way yes please more profound than that in the sense that I'm saying the actual media you're working with, you've given us a description of the, not the superficiality, because death is very profound, but its application in relation to other forms, like you include performance art, also include installation. What my conviction is that act, performance art itself is morphing into walking art, just as in the 60s, fine art, as it was defined at art school then, it had already died with Malevich, you know, centuries, 50 years before. But anyhow, for me, that morphed into what was then emerging, it was performance art. So it's the same feeling I have now, i.e. with performance art, you're literally, it's your being is the art, not on the canvas. 
Yes. And with walking art, it's carrying that being into different mm -hmm. locations. So it's progression, it's a movement of it. I'm wondering how that carrying the possess your possession in relation to death, the geography of death, which you've used descriptively, the places that you stop at aren't necessarily death symbols. It's more the process that you, i.e. with the audio, with, with mobile phones and with all the technology, you're able to, like a word for it is deep mapping. You're able mm -hmm. to map the area with more depth, more than just a map of the area. I'm just wondering at a slightly more profound level, do you see the significance of what you're doing? I considering death to be about the most profound feeling that anyone can either have at the anticipation of death or the act of death itself. Um, so it's a, it's a heavy weight tool that you're using here, probably the heaviest weight in human experience. How does that relate to the media of art, you know, the very substance of art, rather than how it sort of lifts, you know, floats on top of it? Do you see what I mean? So I'm trying to get to you, your consciousness in relation to yeah. your application. It's very much, little... yes, yeah, yeah, I think so. It's very much a conscious decision in the way that, yes, it is about deep mapping and it is about putting the body through something. So the act of walking, the act of being in the landscape, there's something quite psychogeographic and quite deep in your body that's happening both as, and it also becomes multi-sensory. So therefore things are being awakened in you. So it is quite purposefully made through these uh, forms and these practices. Can I come in again? I'm sorry to keep up. Just as Malevich painted a black square on a white canvas, which announced in a sense the end of easel painting, you're bringing in death as an active element in the same way that Malevich brought in the black square on the canvas. You're bringing this into consciousness. You understand? Uh, so I understand your... what you're saying. Well, thank you. I take that as a compliment. Oh, absolutely. I just wondered what you're doing with it. Yeah, <laughs> okay. thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Andrew, you also had a question. Uh, well, one of the ones I asked for, was, so is the walk as much part of counselling uh, as it is a participatory performance? Uh, that's uh, sort of one side of it. So the people okay. that you, the, the, the people you um, that you selected to include the voices that you selected to include were I mean did they come to you or did you go in search of them and 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 did you and and was it part of a kind did they you know after they'd done it did they see it as part of a kind of counseling thing or were they happy for it I mean obviously they were happy for it because they've signed it off and said yes we're happy to be included but you know were they aware that they were becoming part of the performance uh yes they were very aware so i um well there's many different things to to answer that are there which thank you for your lovely question um so one thing that i like to make very clear is that with this work a home for grief as a project which obviously includes the walk is that there are elements of there are elements that can be seen as therapeutic but it isn't it isn't therapy that is something very clear that i hold very very clear uh, and actually this particular time around i did have the support personally and both consulting a therapist because it for myself so i can be healthy through it because it's a lot to hold um but also because I'm very aware that it can be cathartic for people. People often use that word, people who come in contact with the work and therapeutic. But that is not, I don't have, you know, it's, it's not, it's not um, made for that purpose. Right. I think that is a consequence of how the space is being held by, by everyone, including the women's voices. The, the the way that I found, oh, and to say, and then obviously we try to provide as much care as we can, like I said, for those who come, both the participants, myself, people who work with the work and audiences, 
And then participants, so the, the women that I spoke to, I found them in different ways. So some people in Lancaster, three years ago when I was there, um, working on this for the first time in this iteration, um, I went to wellbeing centers, as in, you know, centers for community, local centers. I, co I connected with some community, um, I, don't, I don't know if they would call themselves leaders, but people who are really at the center of supporting other people. Um, I went, for example, to also to a lunch uh, held by women who are seeking asylum and are refugee seekers at the moment in Lancaster. And really what I did was just sat, sit with them and I told them my story. They, they allowed me to tell them to, uh, my story. And from there I said, look, I'm doing this project. If you'd like to participate, there's no pressure and there's no, you know. And one person straight away was like, I would like to tell you my story and I'd like to tell you about this. Um, and then I was always very open with them about what was gonna happen with their stories, including that sometimes I didn't know. Um, and that I would inform them as it developed. So they were always in the know. And I always held, for example, I allowed, I, not allowed, that's totally the wrong word, but I tried to have sessions where they could experience it before other people, for example, and things like that, before it opened to the public. Yeah. Okay, I, and, then, and then I, yeah, no, that's good. And then I, I sort of asked another question, you know, in the same thing almost, which was, does the route you choose go to um, places where people have died um, or places where people's loved ones, uh, that the loved one whom they grieve may have walked? Or is it just something where you've just taken six or seven stories and placed them on an area which you've chosen? And then There's, fit it yeah. so that you can fit the prompts in. I mean, you know, how, how, how have you kind of done it that way? What way? <laughs> what way have you done it? <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, some of the ways that there are some stories which are um, within the landscape of some connection and meaning for those who share their stories. Others, not so much as a particular area. Um, they are local people from those places. Some of their stories go beyond those places. And some, there is, for example, a very straightforward example is that in the Anglican Cathedral in Liverpool, one of the women shares about how she, after her partner died, she made a brick. Because, you know, in the Anglican Cathedral, you can uh, have a brick made for your loved one. And so there is a brick for him there. And the route does take you through the gardens around the Anglican th Cathedral and through the People's Walk, which is where there's the stones, the bricks. So that's a very clear thing that did happen. But then on another way, what we did, me and Will, because um, he's very much a central part of the process for this, we work very much with listening to the landscape, um, both with our ears but also with our bodies and spending time in a landscape and very much in silence a lot of the time to see how people interact with the landscape and that tells us a lot about where this bit should go where that bit should go how this relates what you know uh, could people t use the landscape so they'll tell you how you know they'll answer a lot of your questions as you know um i'm sure so so yes, yeah, so a lot of them don't relate specifically to that place, but they are in relation to something in the landscape, even if it is more on an emotional level, or because you need, at this point of the walk, you'll need a bit of a breathing space. So let's place the walker in a place where there, there's is more expansive and you can look out and you can see the mountains in the distance and things like that. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, yeah, no, that's great. Yeah, thank you. I just I remembered that uh, there was a, an artist called Louise Ann Wilson oh, yes. who um, uh, did a piece, um, a walking art piece about um, infertility and uh, grief for the unborn child. Um, I was I was pipped at the post actually because I asked uh, whether I could interview her and she said, "Oh, I've just been called up by Claire Balding." So um, you know, she sort of tossed up whether she'd 
uh, have me as the interviewer on the Talking Walking podcast or, or go for, you know, uh, two million listeners on the BBC Radio 4. Uh, funny enough, she chose BBC Radio 4. Um, anyway, so I just remember what that was uh, and I just put it in the chat. Fabiola, can you say a few things about uh, why using QR codes in an earlier instance of uh, the work did not turn out as well as you would have liked? Um, <laughs> it worked okay for, <laughs> for that for that uh, trial, but um, it's it's quite complex. I mean, for the for the aspect that you don't want to, they were in little picture frames. We put them in little picture frames, and then we tied them to different places in the landscape. And sadly, there's the obvious things of people nicking them, so people, t you know, like taking the little frames away. Um, there's that. Um, but there's also, at that time, I also made like a map that you'd have with you. So actually, you had more things. So you had to walk around with a map, physical map, and then you had to walk around with the phone. And for for some people, it's okay. You need the extra map. That's fine. But a lot of people, if you can have everything, and this is why Go Jointly was so great, is that you had everything you needed. You know, you had the audio, you had the pictures, and you had the map. So you, you didn't need anything else but your phone and your headphones. And so that was one of the things that with the QR codes didn't quite work. And also, um, they, they don't have the same temporality, right? Because if you want to have something which becomes more permanent, it's harder to keep to keep maintain it as well, um, and so that that was yeah, <laughs> in a nutshell, yeah. So that's a nice feather in the head of Hannah and a perfect segue. Uh, uh, Hannah, um, how many more sound walks are there on Go Jointly? There's probably a handful. <laughs> to be honest, we've we've just started out doing um, audio walks. To be honest with you, because when we when we launched, there were other platforms out there that did sound, and um, some of them are now sort of defunct or like not available. Uh, but as we were sort of starting to do more culture and heritage tours, there was like a, a desire to kind of open up some of those stories um, to people. And, and that's really how we began the kind of journey. Um, one thing I'm missing out, which has only just occurred to me as well, we actually won some funding from Innovate UK. So this is a separate pot of funding to explore whether or not augmented reality uh, could enhance the walking experience. And as a team, we're not necessarily pro AR in that we find it quite gimmicky. Uh, so we were coming at it from a completely like an angle was like, can we make this work? And so as part of a trial, we basically narrated uh, stories behind these trees in some parks in Bermondsey. Uh, we, as you walk to, as you kind of um, experience the walk, you could hold up your phone to the trees, and a face would pop up, and then the face would tell you about the things that you might find on the walk, or the history, or the fact that this old path used to be the Necking River, and things like that. And we um, did a kind of some user research with like a group of different age groups, uh, families, uh, single people, men, women. And we went and led them on this, uh, this walk. One was just sound only, one was sound and AR, um, so you could see the faces. And then um, one was just like our usual step by step walk where you read the text. And actually, what we found is that people were more comfortable with listening to to the um to the experience rather than looking at the augmented reality that was happening on screen so um a lot of people felt really uncomfortable like holding their phone out in the middle of the street uh, in case they got mugged or something or it's just still quite an alien action to kind of hold your phone out so a lot of people were like mm, not really plussed about the augmented reality so actually just held the phone to their ear to listen to what the story was and um it just made us realize that actually the the kind of sound is probably doing enough of the the story making and the narrative 
and um, that you don't really need the augmented reality and like as a team we're not convinced like until you can wear a pair of glasses or contact lenses to experience the augmented reality actually there's probably not much point doing it um so yeah, so that actually helped fund the, the audio um, element and actually gave us some data and insight on whether or not it could enhance certain kind of walks and tours and experiences. So that's how it came about. And yeah, we probably got about 15 or so audio walks and um, we'd like to get more on, but to be honest with you, we're, we're trying to promote leisure walking and active travel and get moving people around cities sustainably. Um, that's like our focus, um, but we're really happy to be able to work with artists and theatres and creatives and authors to kind of narrate and, and host their content. Thanks. Um, and also, uh, as far as um, uh, apps that provide for the creation of soundworks is concerned, it's still a bit of a crowded field. There's quite a, a lot of platforms that allow for it, uh, even if they may not uh, uh, pursue it as their primary um, objective. Uh, Which ones well, are those? You. Uh, off the top of my head, uh, it's not so easy, but the one that immediately springs to mind is Gesso. Yeah, Geert indeed uh, made um, a long blog post of like uh, 40 platforms uh, or so that uh, actually do this. Um, That's a lot of competition. Is not... <laughs> yeah, it's a tough world. Um, but Go Jointly is not even in there. And for that, we have to blame Geert. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Um, I don't mind. No, but it is a, a fairly long list, and not all are still alive, um, but uh, quite a few still are. Um, but most of them, uh, like yourselves, uh, uh, they are not primarily focused on uh, on making sound walks. They're more about uh, creating uh, uh, walks uh, that have markers in uh, in uh, on on the, on the map that you can follow, uh, that you might be able to attach audio to. Um, uh, thanks. Uh, um, Bob had another question on, on the democratization of uh, reef. One of the climate control demonstrations some years ago that I was on was announced as a walk for grief, grief for the potential death of life on Earth. Do you think this is a way to democratize this experience from an individual onto a group experience? Now, Andrew put a, 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 an added point that he worked with the army walking for people returning from war zones. I know as I, this is a quote from him, I know as I work with UK Land Army on a suite of walks in Seven Oaks Forest, these were group walks, there were many. Now, my question back to him, would then be, thank you for experiencing that, but this is freeing the outcome, the therapeutic outcome of that would be to presumably allow, as their professional soldiers, them to be able to kill again. Now, as a consequence of a climate control demonstration, the, which is more political, the outcome of that would be potentially for people to take active action. Um, so in a sense, the outcomes are different. So my question would be around the, 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 um, the phrasing of it. And I think it's significant how we aim it, how we uh, direct it, and whether or not we want it to be, to have a, a political dimension, or, what, or whether we want to just, in a sense, do it for its own sake. I mean, I think they're both valid, but I would be interested to know your reaction to that. From my, my perspective, I think um, walking as an activity or action has been a, a kind of a political act for a long time, hasn't it? Be through marching and protesting, you're walking. Um, so I guess naturally it can be political. Um, I don't know necessarily how it could connect with I guess the climate crisis and that's impact on people like climate grief and eco anxiety. But what I do know and I, what I didn't share with you earlier is that on our iOS platform, we actually have this feature called uh, Nature Notes. And it's based on um, a science project that we worked on with the University of Derby um, and their team is called the Nature Connectedness Research Group. And what they 
the evidence behind the work that we've been doing has shown is if that if people note down good the good things that they see in nature every day it can have clinically significant improvements to people's work, mental well-being um and that sounds a bit obvious when you say it but actually it goes further than that in that it's uh, the kind of impact happens when you tune in with your senses so if you listen to the leaves rustling in, in in the wind or you watch the clouds floating over the sky or you notice the weeds um in a in a, in a pavement crack um if, if you tune into those things that is the and note them down that is the thing that helps with your nature connection and what then happens is that the kind of more connected to nature you are it shows that the more uh, pro nature conservation behaviors you develop so actually you know we've had we've kind of had this completely different relationship with nature where it's dominion uh, like kind of dominion strength control when actually the kind of relationship that we need with nature is a new one it's one where we're like we see ourselves as part of the natural world as well and realize that actually we are all nature and we all need each other so whilst we I, I probably can't answer your question properly in a way I can sort of like give you a bit of background of, about why we call ourselves a walking wayfinding and nature connection app and one of the results from the study showed that if you if you if you just do it for one week it can have one month's benefit to people's mental well-being so in all of our walks we're always prompting people to look up look out tune in listen touch uh, and be you know enjoy nature in a way that perhaps is like unfamiliar with you so when i was a kid and i was growing up it was in the 80s we never went out we never went to the park i just watched vhs all the time and so like i was scared of mud and um i remember going for a walk in northumberland and a, and a pheasant made a sound in the woods and i like fell over in fright uh, so i'm like like a really <laughs> useless nature connectedness person but since then i've learned to sort of tune into like the seasons so noticing cow parsley in bloom and then turning to seed or noticing um, the dawn chorus uh, and things like that so my hope is that we help people get a better relationship with the natural world they see themselves as part of nature and then they develop pro nature conservation areas and then that works to kind of help prevent things like biodiversity loss and um, complete climate breakdown uh, but i feel quite emotional talking about that so i'm going to stop there <laughs> Could I just come in with a uh, follow-up? Taking a cybernetic of walking art, you've outlined a political, psychological and career application. Now, I think, you know, the, the, the world's, the sky's the limit. I think it's got so many applications beyond these categories. It would be fun to think of how else it could, you know, it's like holistic, whereas easel painting per se just relates to itself. This is and performance art just relates to the individual. What we're doing here, we're, we're throwing it right open. So it, it, it relates to every aspect of human experience, living experience. So it'd be a, it, you've really opened up an area that, that is terrifically exciting as a potential platform. Thank you. Can I quote you on that? Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> we'll send you the video in a few days, right? Thank you. <laughs> um, related to this, uh, I have another question for Fabiola, uh, specifically Fabiola, because um, you are on uh, the cusp of two cultures. Uh, just before the recording started, uh, we talked about how um, uh, you are of both Portuguese and um, uh, Angolan descent. Um, and myself, I'm uh, half Iranian, half Dutch, so I'm also very much... Um, uh, a child of two cultures and uh, as far as and I, well I've lived in Africa for seven years but I'm not familiar with Angola uh, but if I uh, extrapolate a little bit from what I know from uh, surrounding countries to Angola uh, and specifically look at my own experience uh, with uh, Iran and specifically grief in Iran uh, is that the way that people deal with grief um, in my father's country is completely different from the way that people deal with grief in my mother's country uh, and that goes back to uh, the point that uh, Bob raised on how um, maybe this experience through a sound walk like this um, is in a way democratized or um, put into a context where you are sharing your grief with others to maybe ease your grief. 
Um, but that's my interpretation. How do you see it? Yeah, uh, ease. I suppose it's to find, in many ways, is to find my tribe, <laughs> if that makes sense. My my grieving fellows, my grieving brothers, sisters, and you know, um, and to be able to feel and to feel like yes, we're not. We have a, a personal experience, but we're not carrying it necessarily alone because it is something which is shared um, of the human experience. And then to go back to the beginning of what you were saying of me being on the cusp of the two cultures, um, my experience has been quite different to some degrees. I mean, in many ways, but this would be for a longer, longer conversation, but just a little tiny uh, uh, just grain of sand, their tiny, tiny thing is that obviously Angola, because it was a Portuguese colony for so very long, has a lot of connections with Catholicism and, you know, Portuguese ways as well. But my experience is that, um, so my dad's, my, speaking from very personal experience, my dad's family, they, are also atheists apart from my grandmother who I speak in this work of in this work um, who had Alzheimer's um, and um, eventually and she had all the rituals she knew everything what to do if you lost your keys she knew the exact prayer you know and she was very very keen on rituals surrounding the death of my dad uh, and many of those that happened was because of her um, but there was also my granddad, for example, became very silent about my dad. He wouldn't really always, always talk about it. I think it was a bit different because I was a child. So he didn't do the, oh, shush, you know, to a child. So he wouldn't do that. So if I asked, he would tell me. But I think between my grandfather and my grandmother, there became a chasm where my grandmother really wanted to talk about it. And my granddad really didn't want to talk about it. And also it was very private. One thing, though, with my grandmother's generation, she was born in the 30s, and here in Portugal, that generation, when someone when someone died who was very uh, close to you, you would dress in black, all in black. So there was very much, and my grandmother dressed in black until she couldn't dress herself anymore because of the Alzheimer's. Um, but it's very much a signifier. So when you go out, I experienced how people would approach my grandmother through that signifier. So that was one thing, but it's very much private and even the rituals around it can be more private. And then with my Angolan family, some of the wakes that I've experienced, in Catholicism, the body's present if it can be, and uh, you have an open casket if it's possible. Um, and with my Angolan family, you have this thing of everyone comes. If they can come, they'll be there. Like you have a neighbor that comes and you're like, who's that person sleeping in the church overnight? Who's that? No one knows. Maybe it's the, you know, some auntie, like, you know, in Portugal, in, in Angola, if there's an elder, there are aunties and uncles. It's some auntie that no one really knows, but she probably knows someone and they've heard and so they come. And that's a lot of the experience that some of the women who are of other cultures and ethnicities that shared within a home for grief is that there's this disparity of like come let's sit down let's talk about it let's talk about your loved one and how much you miss him and everything um whereas sometimes there's this thing of oh let's not remind one of the women says um sometimes that her family and friends feel like oh she's having a good day so let's not remind her so let's not ask about it because we're going to remind her and she says and i'm quoting there's nothing that can remind me of it I know it, I know he's dead. I would just like people to talk about it, you know? So I think there's often that disparity. And also it's interesting because my mother, for example, from an Angolan heritage, she just wore white for quite a long time. So that was another thing that was, you know, it was quite interesting, just talking at colors and signifiers. Um, yeah. Thanks. Um, Andrew, uh, in relation to this asks, um, uh, or, well, before I ask, and ask Andrew's question, uh, we heard one piece from, one of the audio pieces from you from uh, Lancaster. Um, are the other two pieces also only women? 
Yes, this question often comes up that Andrew is asking. I read it in the chat. Um, okay, think... so, but I'm going to say it because oh, no, yeah, sorry. Not, like, do say the video it, do is say not going to be yeah. on the chat, right? Sorry, of course, do um, say it. Uh, well, Andrew's asking whether, because men uh, often uh, might grieve very differently from women, are, are you considering to in the future maybe explore uh, working with mixed groups or with men only? Or are you not at all maybe considering working, doing this again? That's also possible. So we are really looking forward to doing it again. <laughs> And we're really looking for opportunities to do it again, to continue to expand and to continue to tour the work, um, both in the UK as well as eventually internationally. That would be really wonderful. Um, now to the question of men. I do find that men, and I'm generalizing to an extent, but from conversations I've had from that sprouted out of a home for grief with men in particular, in particular, they do often grieve very differently because of societal pressures more than anything, I find. This is my interpretation of what's been said to me. Um, and I, I also found that people, often women, but also men, come to me and say, thank you so much for having a space where it's only women talking, because often it is mixed or there's more prevalence of male voices in a space. And so I hold that very tenderly, you know, and carefully. What I would, what we would like to do, you know, me and Will as we're developing, we would like to be able to go further and for example, within the exhibition, host events for men, for example. So you go on the walk, you experience it, you come inside and then we can talk about, we can have a more open discussion. So I think we are more at the moment more interested in that kind of engagement, partly because I think because males grief with all societal pressures and things that people learn um, on how to be a man, you know, within that, um, I think that would be a whole other project that would need a lot of care and attention. And that I don't think it would do justice just to do it like a quick offshoot. So I think I am interested in it, but I think it would take maybe another six years to develop. <laughs> well, you're still young. I am. I have time. <laughs> but yeah. um, also relate, somewhat related to this, uh, but for Hannah, um, although I have a feeling I know uh, what the answer is going to be. Um, uh, Hannah, how do you solve uh, the chicken and the egg problem of expanding the reach of your app? Cash. <laughs> I was not expecting that answer, <laughs> but it's the most obvious one. You're right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but actually, this only displaces the problem, right? Because who's going to give you cash uh, to uh, uh, roll out Go Jointly in Brazil? Um, Brazilian Public Health Organization. Yeah, <laughs> if you find one no. uh, that would do this, uh, keep me advised. <laughs> Um, to, like we are a tech for good company, and we lit, we, you know, like we made it to concentrate on the UK to begin with, and we have aspirations to to you know have walks in wherever wherever you are in the world. Like I think our, I often say that our dream is that wherever you are in the world, you'll be able to open up the Go Jointly app and find a nature walk within a two mile radius. Like that's the North Star, um, but not at the expense of kind of making sure that we do a really good job here. So we've got like around 17,000 walks that are curated on the Go Jointly app that have been made um, by hand and photographed and uploaded. And then we have this feature, which is the one that creates dynamic green routes from where, wherever you are. Like that's probably the one that would work in other places yep. a bit better. Um, but you know, like it is, it's cash. Like I, I, I have to build my product um, business incrementally. So we're doing it sustainably. Whilst we are self-funded, we do have paying clients, we do have paying customers. And so every time we do one of those projects, we can do a little bit more of what we call our product roadmap. And um, that's like how we've scaled so far. Um, I don't think, um, 
you know, like we're not a venture capitalist business. You, you, you know, we, you know, we're a social impact company. We're not the next Facebook. We don't want to be the next Facebook. You know, that's not what we're trying to create here. So I think by doing it slowly and sustainably, hopefully we build up a real community of people who enjoy the app, who use the app, who, who enjoy micro adventures, mini experiences. And, um, you know, if, like, for example, um, a big transport organization in France got in touch and they were saying, like, we're desperate for a platform that promotes walking and cultural tours and connects people with nature. We love what you're doing. But again, that takes time. So I imagine if we were to scale, we would scale in other cities first. So let's say Paris, if they got in touch and were like, can we make some walks in Paris? Then we translate the app and we do that and we just do it in that way rather than uh, go big and then go bust. Yep, yep, I understand. Yeah, organic growth. <laughs> Um, it's just been amazing to be able to listen to Fabiola because like our previous communication has been brief, a uh, very sort of like a project management led. <laughs> and, uh, so I was just fascinated as how you sort of like re research and then sort of like curated your route, because there must have been like a whole process of like mapping it out and then adding the different layers. And I also sort of like added to that. I noticed on all of your pictures, there's like a blue path. And I remember I went to Lisbon once and there was this blue street and it was physically a blue street, but I'm imagining that we didn't, you didn't paint the streets. That's just done on Photoshop. Is that, is that right? Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So yes. tell me, how, tell me about it. Yes, that's right. <laughs> that is a Photoshop. <laughs> I've uh, become a little bit more versed on Photoshop after um, embarking on this project. Um, still, still a baby at it, but you know, taking my few steps. Uh, but yes, um, uh, I yeah, it was it was quite it's quite a process. Actually, one of the things that I was very excited about go jointly was that we could have the autonomy to create the walk. That was actually really so. There wasn't so much pressure on both sides to have to look a certain way, feel a certain way, you know, because I was pretty sure that I was going to do something quite peculiar. Not with um, just the blue on the floor, but also some of them are quite close up. So it's not so much about the walk itself where there's audio, as you can see, it's quite close up because it's about the actions in the landscape. Um, and so the process was very much like I mentioned before a little bit, but knowing a location, so going into the location and we had starting points because our partners, the venues, were you know in certain locations in Lancaster specifically they're very much out of town because they're based at the university so we were focused we started with the center of town so we kind of have a starting point of where we start walking from and then we did a lot of walking um, we really walked for hours in the place and just you know experiencing the place the people it's um dynamics as it were for lack of a better word but maybe that is a good word the dynamic of people and the place um because i'm not from any of those places so i don't have that intimate knowledge so i think we tried me and will to capture that intimate knowledge and also that's very much part of our practice will started it in his own practice but we very much collaborate and are becoming more and more of a company um but the psychogeography you know and going on these walks and drifts and um, and experiencing the place quite physically. And we sometimes, what we do as well, and we made a film called Canning Town <laughs> that you can, yeah, it's been touring. Um, and it's about dancing, going out at night and dancing in this place. In many ways, like the walk, but it's a visual piece. Now it's a 10, 10 minute dance film. Um, but so we really just, be and feel the relationship of the place with ourselves, but also between the people and the place. And so from that, we also then had your app and we were with the app and we were kind of framing then, trying to frame to capture in a way that was both sensitive to the place that also with the app, 
so that it felt like you know they were quite um uh what am i trying to say integral to one another so not something that felt quite jarring or anything but something but i mean i say that but the app already does that it, it's quite you know it, it it really holds whatever it is the landscape that you're having but you know still we were just kind of trying to feel for a place to frame it so to call attention to that part of the landscape so we took a long time doing that and capturing loads of photos and i figured out how you cut them <laughs> to then try and see how to best frame it and it was a real process the other thing we discovered is that particularly in england because the weather can be so yeah, i was gonna ask <laughs> so about dark. the weather <laughs> the weather can be so i was literally chasing the sun and the blue sky even if it was a slither of blue sky we've realized that also because of the themes and where you're listening if oh, the yeah. pictures if the pictures, if the day was grey when you were walking, but the pictures had a bit of blue sky, had a bit of light, had a bit of sun, then you could envision what the place and feel a little bit what the place feels like in a warmer moment, if that makes sense. So we really tried to do that as well. I was chasing the sun, like six o'clock in the morning. Oh, this is good. Let me take the pictures. Yeah, yeah. that was one of our sort of yeah. design considerations when we did the app. We were like, because it was photo led. And my uh, co-founder, he was like, you do realize the sky is always white in the UK. And I was like, yeah. oh, God. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, it was definitely a consideration when we came to designing the app. And then, like, I just had one more question, actually. I just wanted to know what the feedback was like from the participants. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah. I have a bunch for you. I just haven't been able to compile it all. Um... I mean, your feedback on your event. Oh, I see. <laughs> Do you mean mine from from like what what? Oh. Yeah, so like what? How did did it did it change people's perspective in any way? Did you get any like interesting insights back or was yes. it? Was yes, yes, I think so. Yeah. A lot of people from our particular walk, and I say this with no disrespect to what I'm about to say, like to other walks and other feet, other ways of framing like the landscape these uh, and these aren't my words as well but what was interesting as well was because they uh, people were noting that they are very used to listening to tours you know going around and listening this yeah. is the historical bit of here this is the other historical bit and so they were really what some of the people were really pointing at is that they got the historical sto personal stories so you've got a different kind of history and yeah, so like that history exactly which you can't yeah. capture because you don't even know those people directly oh, you know yeah. and exactly so they were very much interested in the yeah oral stories and experiences of people that they don't have insight otherwise into their experiences but then also like some people were so <laughs> one person in particular was so excited that she didn't get lost and do you know i have to say that is such a precious thing within this work because you don't want people to panic. You don't want mm -hmm. people to feel um, anxious. And and it might sound so simple, but actually it is so important and it was so valuable. Whereas yeah. they say, oh, with the technology I use, sometimes I get really confused. And, and some people were a little bit, sometimes uh, felt a bit intimidated, but we really explained to them and they trialed it with us a little bit as well. And once they got going, they were quite happy. They were really happy and and lots of them have said, oh, let's do it again. Or how long is this staying on? Because I know so and so that would really benefit from doing it. Um, so I think, yeah, people are really. But I will I will just send you like not the full thing, because we have a book, actually. <laughs> we you. have a book where people write and they wrote oh, a nice. lot. Um, it was really wonderful. But I'll just send you a few things because I think it would be you, you'll get feel for what people, you know, experience mm -hmm. to do with the walking and, and your app. And I think that's important because you don't get the feedback in that way. <laughs> that no, right. we only get we only get grumpy people giving us feedback. <laughs> exactly. But there's there's <laughs> there was no grumpy people, really. <laughs> good to so hear. that's good. That's yep. good to know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Question, uh, Fabiola, for you. What was the name of the film? Canny, Canning Town? Oh, it's Canning Town. Um, at the moment, it's not available online because we've been touring on in festivals. 
But basically, Canning Town is a place in East London, um, which mm. I lived in for 10 years. And it's, it's kind of, it's between the regeneration from the Olympics and also from London City Airport and the city. So it's kind of being encroached on all areas with regeneration, uh, like a gentrification more than anything, I'd say. And, um, and because I was leaving for Liverpool, me and Will were leaving for Liverpool and my mum was coming back to Portugal. She was living with me at the time. We thought that we would make kind of an ode to the place and to the 10 years that we lived there. And um, so we went, yeah, on these, this process of spending the night awake and dancing in the streets. And uh, one final question, and uh, b before um, we wrap up, is uh, what's next, Fabiola? Uh, holidays <laughs> for the first time in a year <laughs> in a long time. On the beach in Portugal. <laughs> On the beach. That's why I'm a little bit red. Thank God. The sea takes a lot of things. It brings a lot of good things. It also takes a lot of things away. So that's my big, big connection with nature um, as well as green spaces. Um, but also, yeah, we're really looking forward to continue to share a home for grief. Like me and we'll have other projects being developed and, and everything, but that would be for a totally other conversation. But we're really interested in, you know, people experiencing these walks that we have would go jointly and we're looking for ways to make them permanent with not only go jointly, um, that is already something we've spoken about, but supported by the partners that we already have. So that go jointly doesn't take the whole weight of it as well. Um, and, and yeah, you know, tour it. If there's other places that we can develop walks, that would be wonderful. You know, just just continuing these conversations, and I'd really, really want to connect with people on this level. So, yeah, and you know, I I say here, but the partnership with Go Jointly was such a wonderful like meet up of practices and wants and dreams of you know a good force for good things that we're doing and caring for people in our own ways and through our own mediums. I think so. Yeah, and I really appreciate that. I've, you guys invited me. It's so wonderful. It's been so wonderful to talk to you. Yeah. Well, thanks to Hannah. She was um, the spider yeah. in the web there. And then, uh, well, I, I have the same question for Hannah, but I hope to nudge Hannah you into uh, um, uh, rolling out the automated uh, green walks that you have in the UK to, uh, well, the rest of Europe, but or the rest of the world, but the rest of Europe I would be happy with already. Okay, I'm on it. <laughs> Doing All it right. now. I'm, I'm hoping to be in Europe uh, maybe in a week or six. Can I be ready by then? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I'm not sure if the UK will let me in uh, with all the COVID. Well, if, 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 oh, we let, anybody, we let anybody in, don't we? <laughs> I get different uh, kinds of messages on this uh, from where I'm sitting. I know. But, uh, um, yeah. Okay, there, there's a the little bit of chatter still on the, there was a little bit of chatter on the chat. Uh, Andrew particularly mentions road piece. I have no idea what road piece is. Do you want to say a word about this, Andrew? Um, yeah, it's a charity that was set up about 20 years ago. It campaigns for, um, you know, the um, reduction in um, uh, the use of cars and, um, you know, greater sentencing against those people who kill people in their cars. Um, they um, uh, they're quite well funded uh, as an organisation, um, and um, consequently, they're quite open to exploring uh, different areas in which they can, you know, spread their campaign message. And you know, the <clears throat> part of the thing I mentioned when I said do you actually go to places where people have died? Uh, that is because 15 years ago, I guess, we were approached when I worked at the National Children's Bureau to do something around um, deaths of young children by uh, in car collisions. Um, so there's something called the Road Danger Reduction Forum and the Reese Jeffries um, Fund, both of which have funding available for projects, and so does Road Peace. So, uh, uh, there's also a fund that the Department for Transport that provides as well. So there are other places where you might get traction, as they say, especially if you look at uh, child death. 
Um, and I think, you know, that was part of what I was kind of say, hinting on when I was talking about, you know, is this partly counselling or is this partly performance? Because Hannah, you mentioned that you were uh, looking for walks where you could uh, push your buggy um, and your child. And, and, and Claire Coleman, who's quite a well-known walking artist, did a, a performance piece called Perambulator. Uh, so it might be worth you having a check out on her work on Perambulator because that was all uh, about um, uh, yeah, uh, walking with women with buggies to see where oh. they could or couldn't walk. Um, Hannah, yeah. Hannah, if you want, I can introduce you. Claire was my lecturer. <laughs> oh, was she? Yeah. Well, there we go. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. And Bob, luckily, you I don't have to push a buggy anymore, so <laughs> but I should do it to empathise with my users. <laughs> yeah. And Bob, you also had um, uh, another point to raise. Yeah, just a clarification. Uh, two things of applications that spring to mind with necrogeography, i.e. the geography of death, along with political, psychological and career, uh, philosophical and anthropological. I know there's loads of well, but there's just a couple there that hold, throw it right open. Thank you. Uh, I think with that, uh, we should call it a day. Thank you very much, um, Hannah and Fabiola, for... Uh, Thank you. This... Thanks, everybody. Ah, no. Thank you ah, so well, much. Totally our pleasure, uh, really. Um, thanks for the extended discussion. Also, uh, what um, um, I find really enjoyable about um, a discussion like today's is that, uh, uh, of course, we're talking about sound walks, but uh, we are talking about... Uh, Sound, sound and walking art in a context in which it is not very often used, in a context which is extremely socially relevant, but often or very often gets very little attention. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's good to see that, uh, it's very good to see that, uh, um, well, you, uh, Fabiola, have taken this type of subject and put it into something that can easily be consumed, but also uh, raises um, yeah, serious questions. Uh, and it's very nice to see that there is such a lovely app that uh, can provide this uh, functionality. Um, so with that, uh, again, thank you very much. Um, thank and you. Uh, hope to see you at a next cafe or at a yeah. screening. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, everyone.